this chunk. There's the bell firing, the hammer on the left of it. They weren't renamed the Queen's Troop. Queen Elizabeth said they should be called the King's Troop in honour of her father. And the same thing is going to happen. The Queen's Company of the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards were the closest escort here for Her Majesty's coffin are going to retain the name the Queen's Company in honour of Her Majesty. Two of the Queen's corgis, like Emma the Pony, Sandy and Mick. The Queen was famous, I don't know how many corgis she had, 50 or 60, I think, in her life. Um, but they've been brought out here just to the right of the arch as the cortege comes into the quadrangle, the private part of the palace. It will go round the king and members of the royal family at the state entrance. figures by now in this procession. The king on the left, Princess Royal, the Duke of Kent, Separate on the far right, the Duke of York in the centre, not in uniform, the Princess Royal and the King coming out, the Duke of Sussex behind, the Duke of Gloucester behind him. And Vice Admiral Sir Jim Lawrence on the far right. male members of the royal family and the princess royal. The other female members of the royal family will travel by car down to St George's Chapel, not march in this procession. towering above Princess Royal, Duke of Sussex passing through. Peter Phillips there. And the Earl of Snowden as well in this procession. They're going through and there there'll be this very simple service of committal. All agreed with Her Majesty the Queen, much discussed. The service taken by the Dean of Windsor. And it contains the psalms, the Russian Kentuckian 
of the departed. Hymns, a reading, a bidding, prayers, more hymns, and then the committal itself, with this coffin being lowered in front of the altar until it disappears from sight. And the Queen's piper will play a lament down the aisle of Westminster Abbey. And now, for the last time, we'll carry it up the steps into St George's Chapel, where it will, at the end of the service, be laid to rest. To the power and empire of Christ our Redeemer. And finally, the imperial state crown, which the Archbishop of Canterbury placed on her head in Westminster Abbey with the words, may she be filled with abundant grace and princely virtues. As a father pitieth his own children, even so is the Lord merciful unto his divine mercy. The late, the most high, the most mighty, and most excellent monarch, Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and all Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories. Queen, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith, and sovereign of the most noble order of the Garter.
which has been seen by so many thousands over these past days, lowered out of sight into the vault to lie later alongside the coffins of her husband, her mother, and her father, and her sister. Many tributes have been paid to the Queen over these past days, some of them public, but many, many more by voices, so many people, who for a moment belong just to her family. And with me watching every moment of that service that was replete with symbolism and poignancy, William Shawcross and Sir David Canadine. Uh, William Shawcross, if I can come to you first of all, the words that so forcibly struck me were the Dean of Windsor's address, saying in the midst of our rapidly changing world, her calm and dignified presence has given us confidence to face the future. What were the standout moments for you? He was absolutely right. I thought his, his words were exquisite. He talked about her great faith. gather from across the nation, from the Commonwealth, and from the nations of the world, to mourn our loss, to remember her long life of selfless service, and ensure confidence, to commit her to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Service in life, hope in death. <laughs> 